Hi, this is Care Heart, and what we have here are my entire stack of power pack cards. But I went through most of them with you already. Today I'm going to go through the rest of them to finish the complete deck. And so what I did for this process was a little smarter than the last process because I've learned that Mod Podge doesn't travel well through... Uh, through hot and cold and and sometimes they end up sticking together and they don't bend as well at least that's what I was told so in any case I made these power pack cards by hand painting and you can see I made ATC size power pack cards again and um, I just went with some random painting on these and I have some inspirational ladies I'll talk you through the ladies later that I, fuss, I first I copied the ladies, printed the ladies, and um, I'm not going to make you suffer with me because fussy cutting is not one of my favorite things in the world to do unless I'm really stressed and then fussy cutting's okay, but I won't meander on that conversation. But the fussy cutting here out each one of the ladies is certainly worth it because it looks fabulous on the ATCs and and so whatever image you cut, it may not even be uh, a lady or a man in your power pack. It may be inspirational items or things or stuff that, that you want to put onto your own power pack that inspires you and makes you want to do whatever it is you need to be inspired on. In this case, it is an exchange, and that's why you saw that first picture uh, where I used the baseball ball card sleeves to store all of them to mail them safely. Um, but... What I've done here, I used acrylic paints on the backgrounds of each of these cards. Then uh, let that paint fully, fully dry. I'm not a fan of listening to the hair dryer because as you, many of you know, unless you're new to this channel, I live with a migraine and the drying them in between it just not going to happen. So anyway, I painted them on or, uh, just one day. Waited a couple of days and then I grabbed some gel medium uh, and uh, after fussy cutting out each of the ladies, I laid them onto the card using gel medium as you see me doing here with each of the words. Um, I applied gel medium and what I'm going to do is after all of that dries, then I well, not what I'm going to do, what I already did. After that dried, I went in and I doodled. And so um, I figured since I didn't show much of the early process that I would just leave in what my doodles are, where my head is, and why I choose to doodle here. Um, so often what you'll see me do is come in on each of them and find a way to highlight the lady on the card. Um, here, she's a, an amazing pianist, and this is the only card that I didn't use a handwritten word. Uh, I have a neighbor lady that is just a fabulous lady, and she does the best fussy cutting die cuts. When I say fussy cutting die cuts, she has die cuts where they have the tiniest little holes, and she can pull them out intricately and it just looks like lace in paper form and she gets it. Me on the other hand, when I do one of those super intricate detailed dies, it takes me forever to gradually get it out of there. I'm carefully poking it. Um, I've, I, 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 anyway, I'm not gonna sit there and whine about the dies while I sit here and look at this amazing lady on the piano. So the Library of Congress produces these knowledge cards which teach you about different people. And so what I'm gonna do as I sit here and doodle the images of these amazing ladies and create them in a power pack, which was inspired by an individual named Shelly. Uh, her link I'll put below at Crafting Mamas. She's doing a swap of power pack cards which are all ATC size. And so what I'll take you through on these ladies is uh, the story that I'm getting from the Library of Congress in their knowledge cards. 
And so the lady that I'm doodling on now, while well, you watch me doodle, I'll give you a little history on each of these individuals. Uh, this is Mary Lou Williams. She grew up in a home where her prodigious natural gifts were recognized and nurtured. And so the rich musical landscape beyond uh, provided constant inspiration for her. And so long story short, she is a fabulous pianist and composer, was born in 1910 and passed away in 1918. The lady that you're looking at now, I have shown her before. She is a, uh, I'm sorry, she is Beatrice Webb. She's an economist and a reformer. She was born in 1858 and passed away in 1943. Now, it's important to know that she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth and she was, because she was the daughter of a railroad promoter, um, but she did become one of the best known figures in British reformist politics in the early 20th century. And so in partnership with her husband, they made some amazing differences in, in the political landscape of their environment. One of the things they did is, uh, I, I, guess, I guess you could call it legacies. One of the legacies they left was uh, they created or contributed to the first minimum wage laws the development of the Labour Party, and they founded the London School of Economics. So just like Jane Addams and others of that generation, Beatrice Webb actually found her calling and her freedom in social work. Uh, she documented, she addressed, and she made a very big difference in the vast unmet needs of the urban poor. I'm inspired by people who make a difference for others, um, socially, politically, or even personally. Um, I don't know what her, what her uh, motivation was. But for me, when, when I give to others or when I help others, it is, it is a different level of fulfilling. It's, it's, uh, it's ex it's exciting, it's reviving, it gives me purpose. And so in her purpose, when you look at what she did for all of her society as well as even making a difference in other countries because it led to other countries making changes, um, talk about one woman making a vast difference, even though she looks like a black, bratty little girl in this photograph. It was taken by a, uh, I don't know if you say Fabian or Fabian colleague and friend, um, but that's the source of the photograph. The, the actual photographer of this particular photograph is George Bernard Shaw. Uh, I know that name sounds familiar to me, but it could just be that Shaw's a common name. As I'm doodling on her here, I didn't like how, I, I loved the word liberty for her page, but I definitely didn't like how it was blues and yellows with the background I chose for her. Uh, the, so that's why you see me adding so much uh, red here uh, to feel like I'm, I'm pulling out that, that, darker, that darker color all around instead of just the, the bright little blues with liberty. In hindsight, if I were to do this over again, I probably uh, would have the empty strips of paper and come up with the word after doing uh, the lady on the card. I also used a glue stick for some of the ladies on some of the cards and found that it was tacky. And so you'll see in the other part of this video that I did, uh, uh, I did varnish each and every one of them. So this is Toni Frizzell. She, she is a photographer, was a photographer. She was born in 1907 and passed away in 1988. Uh, the way I'm doodling on her and the reason I chose to put her on this card is I have the light coming from above her. Uh, the table's turned on her for this photograph. The person who took a picture of her uh, is taking a, you know, the tables are turned. So instead of the photographer taking the picture, someone took a picture of the photographer. And so I'm using my doodles to kind of highlight uh, the lighting and the, the camera for the photographer. 
So anyway, she began her career in 31, and she did fashion spreads for Vogue, and she retired in the early 70s. But along her entire career, uh, she made a difference in photography uh, because instead of just doing it inside of a studio, she took the models outside and did made her mark in vogue by taking them and posing them amid craggy seascapes and ruins and any any type of sweeping exterior where it's not just the model that's the great image in the photo it's also the background and so talk about making a difference in how we see photography today and what we take for granted so this lady is Calamity Jane. Her real name is Martha Jane Canary, and she was a frontiers woman. She was born, uh, they are not exactly sure, but about 1852 and passed away in 1903. Uh, even though she was born in Missouri, she was raised in Montana, and she grew up to be a sharp shooting, hard riding, just non-conformist. She didn't care about what her gender was and what people expected of her and her gender. So uh, her colorful life became a part of uh, the Old West folklore. Accounts of her life are a little sketchy. Uh, she appears to have lost both parents at about 12, after which she became a drifter in the mining districts of Montana. Um, and mostly known for being an excellent markswoman and also an excellent, uh, I guess you call horse rider or rider. Um, she, she was quite the drinker. She had her fondness for liquor and distaste, as you can see in this picture, for wearing women's clothing. So she served as a scout for the military and for geological expeditions. And uh, she did settle for a little while in South Dakota uh, during the gold mining heyday, but, uh, but one, of, one of her uh, lovers, uh, if you were to ever read the history on her, which is kind of funny, was Wild Bill Hickok. And so um, in her, her lifetime, she had all different kinds of occupations that she carried out, everything from prostitute to mail carrier. But uh, her nickname, Calamity Jane, the guess is that it was derived either from her compassion she showed to the unfortunate, because she was always assisting the sick during the smallpox, smallpox epi epidemic in 1878, but... The other theory is that it's the warning she gave to men of what might befall them if they got on her wrong side. So I made quite a few of Fanny Bullock Workman that you see here. Uh, she was an adventurer and an author. She was born in 1859 and passed away in 1925. And I think the reason I've done her so many times is I love her hat. So if you've seen my hat video, then you know I have a love, absolute crazy love for hats. But um, this hat, it just knocks my socks off. So I think I did her like three or four times. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about her. According to Fanny Bullock, Barcelona is not a pleasant place for a woman to visit with a bicycle. Even in a regulation street gown, she cannot walk a block alone without being rudely spoken to. So, while she made note of such annoyances, they hardly stopped her during the bicycle tour she made with her husband through Algeria and Spain in 1895. The couple wrote two books about the experience before going on to India uh, and then to the Himalayas, where they make a total of eight expeditions into the then unexplored Okay, I cannot pronounce this word. You're going to laugh at me. Coracorum? Caracorum. Caracorum. Anyway, something like that. Caracorum. It could be. K-A-R-A-K-O-R-A-M. Look that up. Range. Making significant... Now I can't even speak. Making significant contributions to both geographical and anthropological knowledge. So... Their experiences contributed to what we know today. And, 
you know, to make it even better, uh, they did all of their climbing uh, together. And, and I'm struggling to figure out how to put this into words without coming across being kind of funny, but back in those days, unlike today, where if a lady was out climbing and she wore the same gear as the guy, uh, other world-class climbers wore what was appropriate for climbing. Well, workmen, she actually accomplished most of her journeys in long skirts that were the uh, strict attire for ladies of, of that time. And so uh, the long skirts and the outfits that she wore to do her climbing uh, just makes it all the more all the more impressive uh, of that time period. There's another climber that I have in uh, the other pack where when she went on her treks, she did not wear the long skirts, which was uh, strong in a different manner on her part. So it's funny that I look at both of them as being, see, I can do it and I can do it in heels kind of attitude or... I don't, I'm not going to wear the heels. I'm not going to conform with the norm. You know, that, those two different personalities, I consider them both winners. Um, so I, I guess there's no losing when you go out and go on a journey like that. I love how the bow on her hat turned out on this one. So the next lady is Frances E. W. Harper. And you spell her name F-R-A-N-C-E-S. I messed that up over and over and over again. That's why I said that. So she was an abolitionist, a feminist, a poet, uh, was born in 1825 and passed away in 1911. She was the most prominent African-American poet to appear after Phyllis Wheatley. She was born of free blacks in Maryland, then which that state was a slave state. And she, ra she was raised by an aunt and uncle who ran a school. Uh, in her teens, her employer, who owned a bookstore, nurtured her love of reading and of learning. And she came of age watching slave laws become more repressive rather than less repress repressive. Um, Harper began to speak and write about the cruelty and inhumanity of slavery. She left Maryland in 1850, and uh, she taught in Ohio, began lecturing uh, in 1854. That was her career, and uh, you could probably look it up. Uh, the, ad the address, the title of her speech was Education and the Elevation of the Colored Race. So from 1856 to 1860, she spoke for the Anti-Slavery Society in Maine, and after emancipation, she continued to tour and to speak on behalf of equal rights for former slaves. A feminist and grassroots networker, she founded the National Association of Colored Women. Her many poems and her novel, Iola Leroy, are charged with emotion. They serve as snapshots of the South during Reconstruction. And... Uh, added some light to her shirt and chose chose a card that I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but what a strength to have uh, have brought such change and spoken for such change back in the day when I'm sure it wasn't popular to do so. This next lady is uh, Madam C.J. Walker. She was an entrepreneur from 1867 to 19, or she was born in 1867 and passed in 1919. She was born in Delta, Louisiana, raised on farms there and in Mississippi. She actually was married by the age of 14 and widowed at 20. So her real name is Sarah Breedlove, last name. Spell it for you, Breed, B-R-E-E-D, love, L-O-V-E, all one word. Anyway, she went on to become a successful hair and cosmetics entrepreneur, and by the early 20th century, she was the richest self-made woman in America. 
But Walker saw her personal wealth not as an end in itself, but as a mean to help, means to help promote and expand economic opportunities for others, especially African Americans. So she took great pride in the profitable employment and alternative to domestic labor that her company afforded many thousands of black women who worked as commissioned sales agents. So she was also well known for her philanthropy, supporting African American educational and social institutions from the national to the grassroots levels. And Walker's daughter, Alayla, carried on the tradition opening her mother's home and her own and her own home to writers and artists of the emergent Harlem Renaissance, becoming a catalytic figure in that whole movement. So if 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 you look at her strengths to grow an organization and be an entrepreneur. Boy, can you tell the difference between when I'm naturally talking and when I'm uh, paraphrasing what I'm reading while I'm talking. But uh, any case, she's she's a lady who knocks your socks off. So for because she was in the hair and cosmetics industry, I chose a background that was uh, pinks, and the word achieve, because she achieved a great deal. And when I say the wealthiest woman in America, I actually mean not black or white, the wealthiest, wealthiest altogether uh, in America. Self-driven. I don't mean to be making these videos to be so educational, it's just that in the power pack, I thought it was nice to share these ladies that uh, dare to be strong and the details of who they are, uh, what they stood for, and why they made it into the power pack. Uh, so most of the time I'll be talking about something less educational, <laughs> less of a lecture, which is what I feel like I'm doing sometimes. So I sincerely apologize for coming across as if I'm lecturing. And I'm hoping that it's better than if I just stuck it to music while you watched me doodle. Um, I could have done that. Maybe that would be good feedback. Do you enjoy seeing the detail when I have detail to offer? Or would you just rather see the art be put to music? That would be nice to know. I suppose another nice question to ask uh, while I'm sitting here thinking about it is, would, do you think that uh, I bring up information on the nonprofit too often? Uh, I have, I have uh, not uploaded a few of my venting videos where one day I was on this crazy rant, getting so frustrated with people not being personally accountable, but yet very quickly and easily pointing out the accountability issues of everybody else. Uh, that was driving me nuts one day, but I didn't post that rant, and then I accidentally deleted the detail uh, and the whole video, which really kind of stunk. But it is what it is. I mean, accidental deletions happen. We've all had that happen at some point in our life. Um, I don't know why I'm going through them individually here, but this lady you saw before, um, this is Marie Stopes. She was a scientist, but the reason why she's worthy of more than just one Power Pack card, because you, you probably saw her in the other video, but uh, she opened England's first birth control clinic in 1921, and uh, it had major opposition from the medical and religious establishments. Uh, uh, in the in in the whole region, and so you can just imagine how upset people must have been at the time to say, "How dare you even offer the opportunity of birth control?" So I would like to thank her for making it possible for people. And and you may or may not believe in birth control, and I you know if you don't, then you don't, and that's fine. If you do, then you do, and that's fine. One of the things that I feel very strongly about is that how you feel is how you should live your life. But how you feel is not how you should impose your beliefs on other people. And now I recognize that it is my belief that you should not impose and force your beliefs on other people. But the definition of morality um, is an interesting one. 
And I think if you were to ask almost anyone, they would believe that their morals are the right morals. That's why they have their morals. But yet not everybody's morals are exactly the same. But yet everybody thinks their morals are better than everybody else's morals. That's why they chose their morals. Maybe I'm getting too deep for you here. I think I'll, I think I'll get off that topic. So I did do a few of the doodles off camera, like the one I did of Mary Cassatt, who was an art artist, and she has the crazy hair. Um, there's another one I did uh, that's off camera of Ellen Ochoa. I think I show those again up here in a little bit of detail. But the lady I'm working on now is Annie Laurie. Her real name's Winifred Black, and she was a journalist. Uh, she was born in 1863, passed away in 1936. So I'm reading verbatim here. It says she was a fearless, innovative, and persistent reporter, Winifred Black, who wrote under the byline Annie Laurie, spared little effort in getting to a story. So she reported about hospital conditions in San Francisco, um, and when she did her reporting and such, she actually <laughs> dressed as a beggar. She pretended to faint in the middle of the street. Um, and she, her resulting story of being thrown onto a prison cart and dragged to a substandard hospital led to hospital reform and the beginning of ambulance services. You know, what a, what a legacy to leave. Uh, you're the start of ambulance services. So... Um, she got an interview with President Benjamin Harrison at the time, and she hid under a table on the presidential train to cover a tidal wave disaster in Galveston, Texas. She dressed as a boy to get past police lines. Um, anyway, long st we've already talked about this, this fabulous lady that I'm doodling on, so that's why I'm still on uh, Annie Laurie. But... Her unflinching reporting style, her enterprising nature, uh, led her employer, which was uh, William Randolph Hearst, I'm sure you've all heard of Hearst, uh, gave her a variety of plum assignments, so she covered nearly every important trial of her day, World War I and the suffrage movement, and was the first woman to cover a prize fight. Nevertheless, she considered herself just a plain, practical, all-around newspaper woman. Her quote, is I'm just a plain, practical, all-around newspaper woman. That is my profession, and that is my pride. As, as you can see, I did multiples of her as well. Um, she's, she's a fabulous lady, and so since each of these cards is going to end up going to different people, it's okay that there's a couple of multiples because it's not the same person that's going to receive duplicates. So uh, Shelly's so kind as to separate them out, and hopefully she notices that. So I've enjoyed, really enjoyed doodling on each of these, and I think there's a, an acceptable variety of doodles without looking like uh, a classic Zentangle doodle, just more or less trying to highlight the, the lady on the page and, the, and or the word on the page, or even in some cases highlighting the background. So now I varnish every single one of my cards, but the only ones I'm gonna put on camera are the ones that I doodled on today that weren't already shared in the previous video, but have been shared today. Um, I'll put this to music so you don't have to suffer through my crazy talking start to finish and uh, varnish away. Thanks for watching. I'll be back at the end of the video just to say goodbye.
Okay, so here's the varnish I use. It's Delta varnish, and the glue stick that was a little bit sticky was the Restick glue stick that I just showed you there, and that one remained tacky in the areas that came out from underneath uh, a few of the images I used, and that matte medium is the Liquitex that I use. are one of those special people that actually watched all the way to the end. You know, it's kind of like my uh, husband when he listens to music. He gets about halfway through the music and then he switches to the next song. So you're one of those special beach people. Thanks. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. Take care. <laughs>